1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Now today I want to talk to you about a very important subject, and that is how to deal with suffering and glorify God in the midst of that suffering. How do you do that? Now some ask, well, can any sinful man or woman really bring glory to God? And I would have to say, absolutely, yes, you can. Jesus said you can in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So if Jesus made this statement, it's clear. You can glorify him. And that he wants you to glorify him. You should and you can glorify him. So how do you do that? That is the question I want to deal with this morning. Because glorifying him in the midst of suffering is a whole other deal, is it not? It's difficult. It's easy to talk about. It's another thing to do it. And so this is the topic here of our text here this morning because it is a fundamental goal of the Christian life to glorify Him, to be a light and a witness in this world. And this is how you can do it. Notice verse 12 of chapter 4. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you shall also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, and the word reproached literally means to be insulted or reviled. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So Peter here addresses, I believe, one of the most powerful subjects that he can in this particular epistle. Now this whole epistle is addressed to the issue of suffering and different aspects of suffering. We've looked at these different aspects individually. And so this morning, how do you glorify God in the midst of suffering? How do you do that? What should you do? Well, here there are five things that I want to address with you this morning. The first is in verse 12. He says, do not think it strange. This Greek word strange means to be astonished or surprised. And so the first thing he addresses here is how do you think? How are you thinking about the subject of suffering? What do you think about when you suffering? Do you say to yourself, hey, what's the deal? This isn't fair. This isn't right. Or do you realize this is a natural part of being a Christian? This is a part we don't like about being a Christian, but it is a part that is absolutely going to take place. If you stand up for Jesus Christ, this is going to happen. And you can't think it strange. You can't be surprised by it. You can't be astonished by this. You have to realize that this is what is going to happen. Now, Peter has already addressed the subject of the mind several times in this epistle. If you turn back with me to chapter 1 and verse 13, notice he says, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. So he said, you need to get control of your mind in this subject of suffering. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says it again. 
Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Now, so this is a big subject. This is an important subject. You need to wrap your head around this issue of suffering and that it is part of the Christian life. Now, if you don't believe and think correctly, you are not going to behave correctly. Thinking and behavior are essential. They go together. You cannot separate them. Let me give you a couple of examples about how individuals in Scripture, they either thought incorrectly or they thought correctly and how that affected their behavior. The first is Abraham. Why did Abraham lie to Abimelech and tell him that Sarah was his sister instead of his wife? Why did he do that? Well, Abraham tells us exactly why he did this. As he stands before Abimelech in Genesis 20, verse 11, Abraham explains why he lied. It says, And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. So he thought a particular way. And that made him behave a particular way, a sinful way. He lied because he specifically just thought, you know what? God doesn't see. God doesn't know. These people don't know him. This is what they're going to do if I tell them the truth. Then in a good way, Nehemiah in chapter 5 of Nehemiah, verse 7. Now there he is about to reprove. He hears the news that the, the nobles and the, the people of the city of Jerusalem, they are exacting usury or interest from other Jews. And they are they're hurting me. These people are going into slavery to pay off their debts. And Nehemiah said, this is not right. It says there in chapter 5, verse 7, it says, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. And so he said he called this great assembly, and he reproved them. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? Because he thought about it. He thought seriously about the issue. What am I going to do? And he chose to do the right thing. So you have a decision to make. When you're in the midst of suffering, you have to begin to think correctly. If you don't think correctly, you are going to behave incorrectly. You think biblically, then you're going to behave correctly. These two are directly connected together. Now, people are going to dislike you they are going to take advantage of you, they're going to use you, and they're going to persecute you. In some level, at some level, some intensity, that's what's going to happen if you stand up for Christ. It's going to happen. Sooner or later, it's going to take place. Now, if you think it's strange that that takes place, then you're thinking incorrectly. Your thinking is wrong. You need to realize that this is part of the deal of being a Christian. It's going to happen. Jesus said this to his disciples in John 15, verse 20. He said, remember the word that I said to you. So what is he telling him to do? He's saying, think about this. Remember, I've told you this before, and now I'm telling you again. He said to them, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. They will. Not maybe, they will. So this is something that you have to think correctly about. 
do you? Do you think it correctly? Or do you, when you get somebody persecute you, somebody lies about you, somebody speaks harshly to you, they insult you, they revile you because you're a Christian or because you're witnessing for Christ? Do you say, well, that isn't fair. That isn't right. Do you govern your thinking by what the Word declares? Or do you govern your thinking by your feelings? Or by your own sense of fairness? The world is not fair. It's never going to be fair. Because it is inhabited by sinful people like you and me. We are not going to be fair and we're not going to be treated fairly. And so you need to wrap your head around that truth. It's, it's a reality. If you don't think that way, then you will be upset. You will get depressed. You will get concerned over what's taking place. And you will be silent. They will shut you up. And you won't stand and you won't speak for Christ. That's what will happen. Because you'll say to yourself, if this is what takes place when I stand up for Christ, then I'm not doing that anymore because that's not a wise thing. But you will be behaving incorrectly because your thinking is incorrect. So be careful. So is your thinking shaped by the Word or is it shaped by your own set of values, your own set of fairness or by your own feelings? Which is it? The second thing that Peter declares here is in verse 13. He says, rejoice when you are partaker of suffering. Now, this is really easy to say. It's another thing to do. Would we all agree with that? It's easy to talk about rejoicing when you're suffering and you're being persecuted or lied to or lied about by someone else. It's not, it's not fun. When we go down to the pier and we share the gospel during the summertime, I'm telling you, it's difficult sometimes when a person makes fun of you, mocks you, reviles you, or cusses you out. It's difficult. It's hard. It's not an easy thing to handle. To rejoice about that requires two specific things that I think you can see right in this text. The first is, notice, he says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Now, notice that he's not saying, just rejoice because you're suffering. Now, that would be crazy thinking, really. Oh, thank you for reviling me. Oh, I just, I, I love to hear someone revile me. No, that, that's just crazy thinking. It's suffering for Christ's sake. Now, you can suffer and not, it not be for Christ's sake. You can suffer just being weird. You can suffer being obnoxious. You can suffer because you've got an attitude or you have a holier-than-thou attitude towards someone. You can suffer for that. And that's not suffering for Christ's sake. I'm talking about when you suffer as a Christian. Because notice... Remember, that is the, that's the qualifier that's given in verse 16. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian. So, suffering as a Christian is suffering for Christ's sake. Because you stand with Him. And you speak as He would speak. You love as He would love. And that is not always going to get you a favorable response from someone. So if you suffer for Christ's sake, you're not rejoicing in suffering's sake alone. You're rejoicing in the fact that you suffer and get to suffer for Him. Now, why would someone think that way? Only because you see what He suffered for you. That's the only reason why you would think it a privilege to suffer for Him. It's because you realize what he suffered for you. When you realize that, well, that breaks your heart, doesn't it? It softens you. 
inside. And that makes you see suffering for him, suffering anything for him, as an incredible privilege as a Christian. Now, this is the way that the apostles saw their suffering. After they had been beaten, after they had been reviled, they, this is how they responded. This is the way they responded to that suffering as recorded by Luke in Acts 5, 41. The apostles, it says, so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. There's that word. Same thing that Peter is addressing here in our text. He said they went rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the sake of shame? No. Notice it says, for the sake of his name. That's the qualifier. That is the issue. So being willing to suffer for his name is totally different than just suffering for the sake of suffering. And you only do that because you realize how much he loves you. Now this was the reason why Jesus addressed the issue of love of Peter. Remember Peter professed Though everyone else forsakes you, everyone else denies you, I will not. And then he turned around and denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus comes to him after the resurrection, and he confronts Peter, and he asks Peter the question three times, do you really love me more than all the rest of these guys? And this is what he did that for. Notice, let's read the context. John 21, 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then verse 18 is real important. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish, referring to Peter's own crucifixion. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So why does Jesus ask Peter the question? Many times we just think, well, does he just want to know whether he loves him or not? No, much more than that. It has to do whether or not, or not he is going to follow him through the suffering that he is about to experience. And the suffering that he will ultimately pay, the price he will pay for following Christ and acknowledging his resurrection. He's going to be crucified. Now that is going to be the issue for every single one of us in this room. If, if I'm going to suffer and glorify him in the midst of that and be able to rejoice, it's going to be because it's a love thing. It's because I am in love with him. That's why Jesus asked the question. Because that's the only way you will be motivated and be enabled to suffer in that manner. Now, the second thing that enables you to suffer in that way and to rejoice is to remember you will be rewarded to the same extent that you have suffered. Now, that is an important little phrase there, verse 13. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad. Glad, that's going to be an, that's an understatement. I am going to be rejoicing as I see him face to face. Oh, what a day that's going to be. I can hardly wait. That is going to be a joyous day. But he's talking about not only being glad then, but rejoicing now. Notice, do you see how he puts that, those two together there in that text? Very important. You see, if you want to rejoice then then he, what is he trying to focus your attention on? He's trying to focus your eyes on 
what that will be like. The reward of being in his presence and in the gate. Just to get in the gate is enough for me. <laughs> to get rewarded will be icing on the cake. Rewarded? Well, we don't want people motivated by the wrong thing, Steve, here. I mean, why would we talk about rewards? Because Jesus talked about it a whole lot. He talked about rewards. Just if you have a Bible study program, just plug in the word reward, rewards, rewarded, and see how many times Jesus talked about what the experience will be like as we stand in his presence and are rewarded by him. That's powerful. That is an incredible motivation. Why? Why did Jesus talk about it all those times in the, in the Gospels? It's because he wants you thinking about that reward. You see, this is another area and aspect of how you get your thinking correct. Because you're not just looking about a temporary benefit. You're looking at an eternal reward. And an eternal reward is something he wants you thinking about. Because that's going to motivate you. It's going to motivate you like nothing else motivates you. Because it's not just a temporary thing, but an eternal reward. Now, do you realize that the smallest service rendered to him will gain you that reward? Here's one of those verses where Jesus talked about reward. Matthew 10, 42. He said, whoever, so that means any one of us in this room, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So think about this for a minute. Wrap your head around this. The smallest, simplest act of love and kindness to the most insignificant person, a child, they aren't important. They're not going to say anything to you if you do or you don't do some kind thing to them. He said, I'm going to reward you for that. Why? Because he sees it all. He sees it all. He hears it all. He, he watches it. And he records it. Now, that's a powerful motivation. So for those, you, you stay-at-home moms, you that are serving and ministering to your children all day long, I guarantee you, the Lord's going to reward you for that. For that? Yeah, for that. Every time you instruct your child, every time you minister to your, your children, every time you serve your husband, your wife, every time you do any act of kindness around your home, let alone outside of your home. If you teach children here in this church, you're going to be rewarded. If you minister to anyone, anywhere, over the most insignificant thing, he's going to reward you. Is that incredible? What a deal is that? And that should motivate you. If you're involved in the homeless ministry or you're counting cans for our food bank or you're in a jail ministry or you're ho the homeless ministry or any organized or unorganized ministry, God is going to reward you. So think about that because that should motivate you to service. And then when you suffer in the midst of that, Understanding that truth is what is going to encourage you. So are your eyes fixed on the eternal reward or the temporary benefit? Which is it? The third thing that Peter addresses here is in verse 14. He says, if you want to glorify him, then you need to see yourself as blessed. Now this is another issue in your head. It's another thinking issue. He says there... If you are reproached for Christ, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Really? 
you're blessed because you get reviled for Christ? Notice what he says next. He says, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed. On your part, he is glorified. So how do you glorify God in the midst of suffering? Well, you need to count yourself as blessed. Now, this word blessed means to be privileged. Remember, I've shared this with you before. It either means to be happy or to, to count yourself as privileged. And so you count it as a privilege. And how do you do that? You realize that the Spirit of God is upon you. And the Spirit of God is in you. You are a light. And that's why someone is ridiculing you or reviling you. Because you have spoken up for him. But this also reveals the fact that you can't do this on your own. You need the Spirit of God to be resting upon you. Now, this is why Jesus told the disciples the last thing he said to him before he departed and he ascended into heaven. Acts 1.8. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So this is the critical issue that he wants them to realize. You need to get filled with the Holy Spirit because this is the only way you're going to be able to be, notice the rest of the verse, and you shall be witnesses. And that Greek word is martyr. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So how do you witness? How do you stand for him? You need the infilling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the only way you're going to do that. That's the only way you can glorify him and be a witness for him and rejoice in him when you realize that you have been privileged to suffer for him. I guarantee you that transformation in your head can only be done by the Holy Spirit. That's it. Because if not, you're going to think the exact opposite. You're going to say, this isn't fair. This isn't right. This is not a good deal. I need to be silent. And I, I should not speak up anymore for Christ. This is why Paul prayed for the Colossian church. And he prayed this, so that they might endure their sufferings. He told them and explained to them how he said they would be able to suffer for Christ. Strengthened with all might. This is Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all might according to his po glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. See, that all of those are a fruit of the Holy Spirit patience, endurance, long suffering, joy. That is the only place that comes from, is by being strengthened by him. Now, I don't know whether you have ever thought about this, but I, I have thought about it many times, especially since I've gone to several of these places. Have you ever, some of you have been to the Colosseum in Rome, or you've seen it? Some of you have seen the arenas that were throughout the Roman Empire? Uh, there's one, for those of you that have been to Israel with us before, in Bachan, we, our bus, as you drive into this, city, you drive right by an arena that was given over to blood sports. And in that arena, Christians would have died. Thieves and robbers and others would have died because they were put in those arenas as well. And as you drive by, you see there's this, there's this little hole in the stone. It's just big enough for an animal to get through. And that is where those openings are, surround these arenas. And that's where they would allow the leopards and the lions and the bears and so on that would enter into those arenas. In the Colosseum, there are these little square boxes in the stones where they had little elevators. It's quite an ingenious in invention. They'd put the animal on there. They'd pull a couple of pulleys and up through a trap door would come the animals. Throughout the arena, there was no place to hide. 
So what would you think and how would you be able to go through something like that if you were a Christian? I've stood there in those arenas and thought to myself, how would I have handled that? Would I have responded the same way they responded? How did they get through that? And you know the only answer to that is the Spirit of God and of glory rested upon them. That's it. And the Lord will give you that ticket when you're getting ready to get on the train. When that happens, that's what will take place. Remember, Jesus said when you're brought before governors and kings and those that are persecuting you, he said, don't worry about what you're saying. He said, at that moment, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. At that moment, not only the words to say, but the grace to go through something like that. So if you say to yourself, well, I'm afraid I won't be able to handle something like that if that ever happened to me. Well, if you cry out and you ask for God's empowering, He would give you the grace and He would give you the strength. It would happen. And so if you're reproached for Him and for His sake verbally, that's, that's one level of persecution. If you're lied about or you get fired because of your faith, that's another level of persecution. If you're put in an arena, well, that's the ultimate. You say, well, that couldn't happen. We don't do those things today. That would never happen today, Steve. Well, all I can say to you is it happens in other countries around the world today. They may not go into arenas, but they're tortured. They're, they're put in the most vile circumstances. They're allowed to be beaten up by other prisoners. And what's the difference between an actual animal or somebody who treats you like an animal? It happens around the world all the time. I think Pastor Saeed in Iran he was beaten so badly that he's in an Iranian hospital at the moment because of the injuries that he suffered from the beatings in those prisons. But he's just one. There are Sudanese and Chinese and Indonesian and what other country you want. There are others in Iranian prisons this morning. How are they handling that? because the Spirit of God and of glory rests upon them. That's how they, they handle it. And that's what you should be praying for, for them. You should be praying for God's divine visitation upon them, that they might be able to handle it. So I encourage you, realize. Now the issue of reward versus this, being suffering in this manner, let me weigh this for you. This is how Moses waited in Hebrews 11.26. Moses weighed in his mind, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So what makes you weigh that issue? You look to the reward. You look to the eternal versus the temporal benefit. And that's how a person goes through it. Now, fourth, Peter in verse 15 says, if you want to glorify him, make sure you don't suffer as an evil doer. Now, notice he lists several issues. He said here, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil doer. The word evil doer there is, is a general word for evil, either ethically or morally which covers everything in the scripture. That's why I use the word. So any disobedience to any of God's commands would make you an evildoer. And then he adds the one that, you know, most of the people, we read this list and we say, well, I'm not a meat murderer, I'm not a thief, I'm not some bad person. But you might be the other one, the busybody in other people's matters. Literally a meddler. Now, that is also evil doing. So you don't want to meddle in somebody else's ma matters. Now, this is something that is essential to understand. 
If you want to glorify Him, you can only glorify Him by doing good. That's it. Doing evil does not glorify Him. Doing what's right does glorify Him. Doing what's evil does not glorify Him. Because there's no reward for doing evil. There is no blessing. There's no grace to be received for doing evil. Yes, after I do evil, I can repent and get forgiveness. But I'm not getting any reward for doing evil. And I'm not going to experience blessing for doing evil. It only is the result of doing what is good. There is where the blessing is found. The reward is found. Some people, I believe, are going to count you as evildoers, as they did Paul. But you have to know in your mind, I have not done what is evil. I have done what is good. Now, this is the hard part. Because today, you see, Christians are called evildoers for standing for righteousness. Do you realize this? You're called intolerant. You're called bigots because you stand for what is righteous. Now, if you don't have this straight in your head, you're not going to continue. You're not going to stand. You're not going to have the confidence. You're not going to have that boldness that you need because you're going to go, well, wait a minute, maybe I am. In, is, this, is this intolerance? Is this bigotry? If I just speak the truth in love, you're going to question that. So people are going to count you as evildoers. Paul said this concerning himself in 2 Timothy 2.9. He said there, if I can find it, yes, here it is. I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. So you will suffer as an evildoer, but you're not an evildoer. And that is essential you have to have correct in your mind. People will reward you evil for good. And that's hard. David said this in Psalm 109, verse 5. They have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Will people really do that to you? Yes, they will do that to you. If they did it to David, they'll do it to you. If they did it to Jesus, the guy who loved like no one else could love, they will do it with you. So you need to have your head thinking correctly about this. It's going to come your way sooner or later, in some intensity, in some form. But remember this, in John 5, 28 and 29. This is what Jesus said. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Everybody on this planet. And, and come forth, those to, that have done good, to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. So everybody lives forever. Everybody's going to be resurrected one day. And we all have to give account for the practice of our life. Now this doesn't mean that you're saved by good works. But somebody who is saved will do good. They will. And that will be the practice of their life. Somebody who is not, the practice of their life will be to do evil, as each of our lives were before we came to Christ. Now, fifth and last here, if you want to glorify Him in the midst of suffering, don't be ashamed, be confident. This is in verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. Now, notice here, he says, let him not be ashamed. So what's the opposite of being ashamed? What's well, being unashamed? And if you're unashamed, you are bold. You are confident. You are rejoicing because you, you have this correctly lined out in your head. You understand this. You realize this is the result of being a Christian. 
Now, one of the greatest testimonies that you could ever have in the presence of a non-Christian is to be able to lovingly, boldly rejoice even when you are suffering, even when you are being mistreated, even when you are being reviled. That testimony is powerful. Let me show you this in the book of Acts in several examples from Peter and John and Paul. How did they handle being reviled, being charged, being beaten when they had done nothing but shared their faith in Christ? Notice in Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they're being threatened at this moment. And what, how do they respond? In a loving and a bold way. When Paul was before Fex, uh, Felix, the governor of the area, in Acts 24, verses 14 through 16. He said, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship God, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God. He's not depressed here. He has hope. Which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Total incredible boldness here. And I mean, he is, he is proclaiming the gospel, that there is a resurrection and every just and unjust person is going to have to stand before God one day. And they have to give account and I'm thankful that Christ is going to stand in my stead. And I pray that he will stand for you as well. Then in Acts 26, verse 2, Paul again, being as he is falsely imprisoned at this moment, he stands before King Agrippa and Festus. He says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. So he wasn't standing there with a sad look on his face. He was standing there with a smile on his face. He's saying, King, I am happy. I am a happy man. He says, Because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. So Paul, why was he happy? Because he had an opportunity to testify and to share the gospel. And then King Agrippa says to him in Acts 26, 28, Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So after Paul testifies to him, this is Agrippa's response. Powerful. I wonder if we'll see King Agrippa in heaven. I wonder if he was fully persuaded and made that confession. I know we're going to see many from Caesar's household because Paul told us in one of his epistles that the gospel was going throughout Caesar's household. Because why? Paul had falsely been imprisoned and was in prison in Rome. How could the gospel have ever gotten into Caesar's household unless he was there? And Paul understood that. And so he proclaimed the gospel and led many to meet Jesus Christ. It's a powerful thing. So here Peter gives you some incredibly important principles. I encourage you, focus your attention on the eternal reward. Ask God for the power of his spirit to fall upon you so that you can be bold, so that you can be his light and his witness, even in the midst of suffering how much of that suffering we are going to experience in the days ahead, I, I have no idea. But all I know is this is what the Scripture says you need to be prepared for. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be 
and will be prepared. Ask God to change your thinking about how you see suffering for him. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, you have the ability to get on the inside of us, Lord, and change our heart, change our thinking. And, Lord, I pray that you would persuade every one of us here today. Lord, help us not to be silent because of our fear. Lord, help us not to be ashamed of our faith and who we believe in and who we follow. Lord, help us to be bold. And Lord, we know that boldness comes from the infilling of your Holy Spirit. So Father, fill us. Fill every Christian here today. Fill the cup till it overflows. And Lord, we believe you're doing that right now. Make us loving because that's a fruit of your Spirit. But Lord, make us bold because that's a fruit of your Spirit too. So Lord, help us to speak and not to be silent. And then, Lord, help us to handle the response when it's not good. Give us that grace, Lord, that we need. Lord, for those that are just in the midst of suffering here today, right now, this is what this last week has been like for them. Lord, give them your grace to go back to work, to go back to their home, to go back to wherever that struggle is. And be bold and not be ashamed. Be loving and not silent. Lord, we believe you to do that. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, you've never made that commitment to him before, I want to encourage you, surrender your heart this morning. He'll give you the grace for whatever you're going through. He will forgive you of your sins and he will come in and live inside of you and empower you to live the Christian life. Are you willing to do that this morning? Are you willing to come to him and respond to his outstretched hand? If you are, you have to do that by prayer. You have to ask him. You have to invite him to come in and to take over your life. He will not force his way in. You must invite him. Will you do that this morning? If you believe that you're a sinner, you believe that Christ died for you, will you pray with me right now? Say these words in your heart to him. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in, take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to be your disciple. Did you just pray that with me? If you did, will you acknowledge that you prayed with me this morning? Just by lifting your hand, your simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you. Anyone here today? Because we'd like to pray for you. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor for all that you have done, Lord. Thank you for your incredible suffering for us. Lord, help us to be willing to suffer for you. In Jesus' name, amen.